You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Amen. Good morning, family. Good morning. Good morning. How are y'all doing this morning? Bless, bless. Amen. The name of the service this morning is uh, Learning the Will of God. We'll be reading from Matthew, uh, 1 John, and Hebrews this morning. Um, and so I just, I just want to share some information with you this morning. Last week, we talked about learning the word of God, putting our lives through that strainer. Remember we talked about the strainer, putting our lives through the strainer, uh, seeing what God rejects according to his word. You learn the word. You say, what am I doing? You ask God for something and he tells you and you, he puts you through that strainer. And so he'll either say yes or no. Sometimes he says no. Anybody ever heard no from God before? <laughs> Anybody ever heard nothing when you're asking God for something? Amen. So we have to proceed with what he says and we have to accept no when he says no. Sometimes he'll say yes. Sometimes he'll say no. Sometimes he'll say not right now. And so but the most important thing is that we ask him for everything, not some things, but everything. It's a constant process. It never ends. You never arrive. You've got to always seek God's counsel for your direction. The most important thing is to know that when we choose the will of God, God will act on your behalf. Amen. Is that what we said last week? God will act on your behalf because the word says he will. When you do things in order, he will be he will act on your behalf and you can be assured of that because the scripture says so. It's not because I said so. It's because the scripture says so. And if you know that, then you say, OK, I've got to take my life and line it with the will of God. Everything I'm doing from from school to church to prayer to eating our food, I should do everything in order with the will of God. And so we know that God will act on our behalf when we do these things. So um, how do we know it's God's will? That's the most important thing we have to understand today. That's what we want to know. How do we know what is God's will? Have you ever asked yourself that question? What is it? Is it the will of God? And so because sometimes because we're not actively seeking the word of God, we don't know the will of God. And so we're wondering, is this the will of God? But we've never asked him anything else. And we've never sought the scripture. And so the will of God always lines up with the word of God. Don't wake up in the middle of the night and say, God told me to stay angry. Because that's not the will of God. And so even though you may feel that way, you have to align it with what the word of God says. God's not going to tell you he wants you to stay angry if his scripture tells you to operate in love. Amen. And so. Um, I want us to dabble further into godly wisdom, into what the will of God is. And I want us to do it together in the name of Jesus. That's why the name of the service is learning the will of God. As we said last week, the scripture says that we are to be the light of the world. That's what we're supposed to be, the light of the world, not just a, you know, but the, we're supposed to be the illumination of God on this earth. And if we're not doing that, then are we doing our job? Are we doing what God called us to do? No, we're not. And so we've got to be the best light we can be. We have to be access to God. We are the access to God. And it's, if we don't allow ourselves to do what the scripture says and to be the light of the world, uh, what happens is we have unused potential. You have potential. God has a plan for each one of your lives, from the children to the adults, to the matriarchs, you know, y'all, we all have a plan for our lives. And so in Matthew 5, 16, this is what we were talking about last week. Jesus says in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. What good would I do if I'm supposed to be a man of God, if I don't impart my will, my ways upon my children? What good is it if if I say, let's go to church, but then I choose not to? You, you know what I'm saying? What good is it if I say uh, you, you can't operate in anger, anger if I always operate in anger? 
What good if I say, don't, don't lie, but I always lie. You know, what good is that? And so I'm supposed to be the light of their lives and they're supposed to be light of others' lives. We're supposed to be the light of the world. We've got to operate as the light of the world. Anybody ever felt overwhelmed? Anybody ever felt you can't deal with it? Well, yeah, you can't without Christ. He is the only source that we have for strength. We can we can go to the gym. We can do all kind of other things, but he is the only source we have for energy. And so we have to be walking examples of Christ. When you're applying the words of Jesus to your lives, it's always good to know what he's talking about. You don't just go and read in the Bible and say, oh, there's red. This is what Jesus says and says and read what Jesus says and not understand what it says, because the enemy can deceive you. That's what he does. He wants to deceive you. It's always good to know who he's talking to, what he's talking about. And so I always encourage you to have a commentary when you're reading the Bible, reading the word of God. I'm not here to have you jumping around the room. I'm here to have you learning the word of God, taking it with you and applying it to your situation, your household, your children, your lives, your jobs, everything that you have in your life. And so when we read words of Jesus and we want to apply them to our lives, it's always good to first know what he's talking about and then know who he's talking to. You can't just read it and say, well, God says this. No, because you may get your own interpretation, which is not the word, will of God, which you may apply to your life and wonder why God never showed up. Because you didn't take the time to learn the will of God of your life. When you learn it, you'll find that he's never left you. He's always with you at all times. And so it's always good to know what he's talking about, who he's talking to. Was he talking uh, with his disciples? Was he talking with the crowd? Was he talking to the teachers of the law? Because things he says to the teachers of the law, you've got to understand, he's not literally telling you certain things. He's telling you something just to shut up those teachers of the law and the things they were doing at the times. Or was he talking to the crowd? And so... The challenges are we can speculate when we're reading a novel, but we don't want to speculate when we're reading the word of God. You want to know what God is saying to you. You want to know what he wants you to do. You want to know what your lives are involved in. You want to know the pathway for your life. Write this down. Always use spiritual assumptions, not worldly assumptions. Always use spiritual assumption, not worldly assumption. That's why I suggest the commentary, because you don't want to just think, well, I think it means this. No, it has a true meaning. Everything he says has a true meaning. There's a true meaning and everything else is false. You want the true meaning so that you can have the true God show up in your true lives and your true circumstances. Can I get an amen in the house of the Lord? That's why I suggest a commentary, a biblical commentary, as you study the word of God. So you got the Bible and you got your commentary so that you can read the scripture and say, oh, this is what it meant. This is what's happening. A commentary is a written, um, opinionated explanation of an event. And so when you're reading in Genesis 1 or if you're reading in Exodus 1 or whatever you're reading, uh, the commentary will get you a line by line breakdown of what it's saying. And it usually comes with the important details that you need. Uh, What was going on at the time? Who was he speaking to? And so something uh, we want to understand, we want to know is what was happening because it matters what was happening so that you can get the true meaning from God and so that you can apply it to your life in your situation. We're going to continue in Matthew uh, chapter five. We're going Uh, In Matthew chapter five, we're starting at verse 21 uh, through 22. This is what Jesus says. And this is an example of what I'm talking about. You have heard that it is said um, to people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is uh, angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Man, you can read that and think about a thousand different ways. Well, maybe God is, maybe Jesus is saying that anger is the same as murder. That's not what he's saying. Maybe if you're angry with somebody, you just murdered them. No, that's not what he's saying. So there's so many things you can get gather from that. So it's important to have the commentary so it can guide you on what's going on here. 
Um, the first thing you have to understand is Jesus was talking to the scribes. He was talking to the, you know, about the scribes and the Pharisees. They had the Old Testament laws that they taught and they taught those Old Testament laws, but they taught it line for line. This is what you do. It says, do not murder. If you do not murder, you're a good person. So everything else, uh, everything else, you know, before the murder or after murder, you know, if you did not murder, you're good. And he's saying that the scripture says, do not murder. But there's some things in between. This is what Jesus, this is why Jesus says, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. So we learn two things here. And what we're trying to do is get the mind of Christ. The one thing we learn is it's okay not to murder. You're not supposed to murder somebody. Does everybody know that? Somebody shocked on that. Yeah, we're not supposed to murder. So murder is not a good thing. If you want to write anything down, if you're thinking about murdering, whether it's your husband, friend, or family man, whatever, murder is not a good thing. Can we agree on that? Can everybody say amen? Does anybody not say amen? Okay. All right, Mark. Thank you. You don't have to escort them out yet. Okay, good deal. Okay. So everybody understands it's not okay to murder. But Jesus goes a little bit further here. And he when he gives you this, He's giving you what he originally meant. Jesus was the one who gave them the laws. In the Old Testament, those laws that Moses got came from the Lord God Almighty. All right, so if you understand that, then you understand that Jesus is trying to tell them the truth behind the law. Jesus goes further, and um, he's, you know, he goes the extra effort of saying that anyone who has anger with his brother or sister, that person is subject to judgment. And so he's comparing that he's connecting that to murder. Why? Because before you murder somebody physically, you murdered them in your heart. Get that? Before you screamed at somebody, you were screaming at them in your heart first. And what he's trying to do is he's saying all of that is bad, not just some of it, but all of it's bad. Even the thought that came in your heart before the action came in the flesh. So you know that it's okay. Uh, it's, 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 it's not okay to be angry with your brother or sister, but he's talking about a certain context. And the problem is if we're not studying, if we're not look, learning what type of extent he's talking about, then we just go off thinking, oh, I just got mad at them because they did this and that, that mad, that, because I'm mad, I've sinned. No, the, the scripture says be angry, but sin not. It's okay to be mad at somebody. It's okay to, you know, to have frustration, but there's a point where it becomes sin. And that's the point he's talking about here. And I want you to write this down. The extent is important. The extent is important. If God says to love, you have to know the extent of love because God's love is different from your love. Can't you agree? God's love is unconditional. Your love is conditional. If I'm a little angry with my brother and sister in Christ did, uh, because they did something small, does that make my, si my brother or sister, does that make me stand in judgment? No, that's not what he's talking about. Remember, the extent is important. We have to know the extent. Is it saying that I can be upset with my brother or sister for anything? No, that's not what it's saying neither. But you have to understand what he's saying here. It's important to have that fallback on that we call the commentary. Because when you have the commentary, you can look and you get a true understanding and you go down the right pathway. See, what Satan doesn't want is he doesn't want you to understand the word. He wants you to just come here, get a word, go home and not study it and not know it. But if you come here and start learning and studying it and understanding it, you can stand your ground against the devil when he attacks you. Amen. You can know that when he attacks you, that you that you can you can pray against what he's doing. Read the word of God. Understand what he says about your life. And instead of saying yes to the temptations, you can say no to the devil. Because he's real and he wants to attack everyone in your households. And so when you look into a commentary, you'll see that Jesus was referring to the scribes and the Pharisees, their incorrect teaching. They taught that it's that you should not murder but they didn't teach all the stuff in between. And so they got this from the original scripture, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the, the, the Torah, whatever you want to call it. It's the Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, all those books they looked at. And so he was referring to, Jesus was referring to the heresy, the contradiction to the original doctrine. 
That's what he was saying. Because what they would do, they would take stuff and make it, you know, glorify it to their needs instead of the needs of what God has given them. So he was referring to the contradictions, the heresy that was going on. Um, they were adding stuff and they were subtracting stuff to benefit themselves. So Jesus tells them that they should not murder. And uh, that was based on the Old Testament law. The Old Testament law said, thou should not, you should not murder. God tells them, tells them that. But Jesus is clarifying the acts that are leading up to murder, which are bad, which is what we're talking about the conditions of the heart. The murderous intent brings about a murderous act. An angry, you see, you don't just curse somebody out in the natural. You first curse them out in your heart, right? When you're angry, what do you say? Man, I can't wait till they get home. I'm talking about your husbands and wives, right? Amen. When you're frustrated, you, you say, I can't wait till they get out of school. I can't wait to talk to them. I can't wait. I can't. Why? Because you built up that intent in your heart before it came out of your mouth. I can't wait to talk to my boss. Amen. And so um, you have to understand that your thoughts, write this down, your thoughts dictate your actions. Just because you didn't kill somebody doesn't mean your actions were wrong. All right. Because your heart, the actions are created in your heart. Just because you didn't curse somebody out doesn't mean you're a good person. It's what's in your heart that matters. And God doesn't look at everything else. He looks at your heart. And so. Before you go uh, to address an issue. Know that you probably over uh, uh, already addressed it in, in, in your heart a thousand times. How many of you have written a text message before uh, in your heart? If you have a phone, raise your hand. All of you have written a text message in your heart before. You know, because when you get to typing it out, you do this. You back, 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 space. No, I'm not going to say this. Baby. Back, 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 back. back. And, and am I the only one who's done that before? Then all of a sudden, sometimes you get deleted. You're like, oh, man, I, I can't repeat myself. I don't know what I was saying. Have you ever done? If you haven't done that with a text, you've done it with email. You wrote that email. You can't find it anymore. Do you wonder why you can't find it anymore? And so we've all done that before. We've all written it in our heart before. Um, but you have to know. So the Pharisees, what's going on with the Pharisees and the scribes is they were doing something and saying that you should not murder but they had murderous intents in their hearts. Um, and on the other end, they still had, uh, they said to do this, but then they had bad intentions in their heart. They looked good, they dressed good, probably smelt good, but their hearts were all wrong. And what God is saying is God is saying, look, I'm not looking at what you've done. I'm looking at what you do in your heart, how you feel about people. And, it's one thing. I mean, I can say I love you to your face, but wish you were dead in my heart. I can hug you. Oh, you're such a good brother. Talk about you behind your back. I didn't murder you physically, but I did in my heart. That's what Jesus is talking about. And the Lord says that's wrong. He's not saying that we can't be angry with our brothers and sisters. He's not saying we can't be frustrated. He's not saying uh, that we can't be mad at some times. But he's telling us that that uh, that being mad is just as bad, not equal to, but just as bad as murdering the person. And remember, the extent is the key. Jesus is clarifying that the act is bad. But so is the thought. How many know that we have some work to do? Because some of y'all thought some ways about me before. Gotta get amen. Don't say amen to that, please. <laughs> when we're not escaping, uh, we're not escaping judgment because we haven't murdered anybody. If we harbor ill, murderous hearts towards somebody. Jesus is clarifying that the law wasn't just meant for murdering it's also meant 
or a murdering heart, your intentions, your thoughts. Neither one of those thoughts or the act escapes judgment. That's what he's saying. And both of them need Jesus. All of us in here need Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. So the will of God, when we're talking about the will of God, understanding the will of God about that is one, not to murder, but also not to have a murderous heart, murderous intentions. Now, I, I was looking at a, a commentary where it gave a good example. And I want to give you this, uh, you know, I, I doctored this example up, uh, but I got it from a commentary and it talked about the animals in a zoo. A lion, when you see a lion behind, how many of people have been to the zoo before? Anybody been to the zoo? Everybody been to the zoo? How many of you went up to the cages and seen the lions behind the cages and stuff like that? Have we seen the lions before? And yeah, okay. So the elephants and all the animals behind the cages. And so a lion, when you see a lion behind the bars, it sees you and still wishes you dead. Why? Why do, you, why do I know that? I'm not Nostradamus. I can't predict or anything, but I know that it wishes you dead. Why? Because if you take the bars out, how many of you would still be there? Right. Right. And so the bars are the only thing. Can we agree that keeps us safe? If you remove the bars, the penalty would be that the lion would probably attack you. Can I get an amen? The worldly laws, when we talk about that comparison, the worldly laws are the bars that we have. People generally do not murder because of the fear of what? The bars. What are the bars? Arrests, going to prison, or even death, right? Those are the three things that, 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 that I can think of that we're normally fearful of. But when the fear of the laws are removed, the hearts are exposed. That's why you see the mass shootings. Because people no longer fear the, 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 the going to jail. They, never, they don't fear the death. They don't fear any of the laws that are put in place. Get what I'm saying? And so that's why you see these things, because the laws are removed from these people's hearts. They think about it before they actually do it. And so the act of thinking about it, the, the actual thinking about it is more of the problem than the actual doing it. They were already murdering people before they murdered them. And so God sees our hearts. Here's what we need to understand about the Lord. You don't have to, before that person went out and killed those 19 or 21 people, God saw their heart. They were already convicted in their hearts before, before they did anything wrong. And so what you have to understand is that God sees our hearts without the laws, without the bars. Where is your heart? And, and you, you know, God, you we have to understand that God says that God sees that we murder people before we actually murder people. We destroy people before we actually destroy. We curse them out before we actually say the words. And what God is examining is your heart. Where is your heart with every intention that you do? We have to understand that anger is not the problem. Anger followed by hatred is the problem. The Apostle John elaborates on the same thought, and this is how we get the mind of Christ. In 1 John 3, verse 13 through 15, he says this, the same thing. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Write that word down, love. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. And so if we combine them together, this is just confirmation on what Jesus said at the Sermon on the Mount. To hate your brother or sister is murder. Why? Because you hate them in your heart. You kill them in your heart before you do the actual crime. What happens when you harbor hatred towards that person in your heart? What do you do when you're mad at somebody? It's different from when you hate somebody. When you hate somebody, you cut them off. You don't want them to have anything of yours. You don't want them to have any favor in their life. 
You don't want to help them in any way, shape or form. Why? Because you cut them off. You have murdered them in your hearts. Think of a family member you said you hated. If you said you hated them, you, ha you have cut them off completely from your lives. You don't care if something happens to them tomorrow because you have killed them in your heart before the actual deed was done in your life. What else? You don't want to speak to them. They call you. You ignore them. Why? Because you have murdered them in your hearts. They don't exist to you. Why? Because that's just as bad as murder. And God is saying your heart is not right. Because they are dead to you, because you have made them dead in your heart, that's just as bad as them being murdered in the natural. The scripture warns us against a person who contains that kind of anger in their heart and does not have the love of God in their heart. Because the love of God knocks out all of that anger. The love of God knocks out all of that wrath. You can't have the love of God and the anger of the enemy in your heart. Just like you can't have the Holy Spirit and a demon in your body. You can't have both of them. You have to let go of one to take on the other. So the will of God would be not to harbor extreme anger or hatred because the result is not God's love, but the enemy's hatred. Does everybody get that? So the physical act matters and the actions of the heart matters, matter. So, so both things matter. You, but it's not the fact that you didn't do it. It's the fact that you were thinking about doing, doing it. That becomes a problem. As we were, read further in Matthew, you'll see that Jesus continues to confirm what we are establishing within the heart. Jesus, again, is referring to the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachings of the Old Testament. So, you know, that when you're reading the Sermon on the Mount, you know that most of the time he's referring to the scribes and the Pharisees and all of the bad things they did in teaching the laws incorrectly or making them for themselves. Matthew 5, 27 and 28, this is what he says. You have heard that it is said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in, with her in his heart. Wow. <laughs> so, so we get there and we think, oh man, I've never committed adultery. I'm a good man. Okay, well, have you looked at somebody inappropriately? It's amazing how quiet it gets in here. Because Jesus is not examining what you haven't done, just what you haven't done. He's also examining your heart on what you would have done. Look at your neighbor and say, we have work to do. <laughs> and so there he goes again with the heart. He's talking about the heart again. So we can establish, we can establish the same principle. Looking at somebody is not worse than going to somebody's house and committing the act, but both of them are bad. Just because you didn't go to the house, just because something may have gotten in your way, just because you didn't go and commit the act, that doesn't mean that you didn't commit it in your heart already. Can I get an amen? amen. Jesus is saying that the desire and the deed are equal. Hmm. Why? Because they're equally sent. Because you thought about doing it in your heart. It's equally just as bad. And he's not saying you can't look at people. You don't have to put blinders on and not look at people anymore. He's saying when you look at somebody lustfully, you say, I wish I could. That's a problem. You've already done it in your heart. And so the scribes and the Pharisees, they were real religious or following what the law said and teaching condemnation, but they were relaxed on following and teaching the heart of God. And that's where we're here to understand the heart of God. Some of the Jews thought that because God told them not to eat certain foods, it's another example that the physical food defiles them. Oh, you ate that certain meat. You are defiled. Jesus clears this up 
with something similar to what we're already studying this morning. Let's read Matthew 15, 17 through 20. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart and these defile them. For out of the heart, every evil thought, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander, these are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. There he goes again. He's giving clarity. Remember, they went by the religious law. Oh, you ate without cleaning your hands. You are defiled. No, he's not saying that that defiles you. What comes out of your mouth defiles you because all the mouth does is show the heart. The will of God is not just based on our actions. It's based on the deeds of the heart. Because you didn't go out and do something wrong doesn't mean that you didn't do it wrong in your heart first. Because you didn't lie doesn't mean that you wasn't thinking about lying. Maybe the opportunity didn't come here. And what God is trying to do is clear up all of those things that, that hinder us from seeing and hearing from him. Hebrews 4, verse 12 to 13. Let's read this. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So as believers, we have to understand that when we lay prostrate before the Lord, he sees everything. He knows your hearts. He knows your thoughts. Because you didn't do anything bad doesn't mean you're not a bad person. Because you didn't say anything doesn't mean that you didn't want to. God is looking at what our hearts want to do, not what they did. And so the other thing we have to realize is that there are no bars between our hearts and our actions. There are no laws. There are no bars to hold back. If we're a lion, our heart will show us as a lion. If we're angry, our hearts will show us as angry. Because you act good around people and act great around your friends, your family, doesn't mean you're not a bad person. And what I'm saying is only God can change a heart. And so God knows there are, he doesn't place any bars between our hearts. Sometimes God knows that if you weren't in fear of going to jail, you would have murdered somebody. If you weren't fearing in, in having a life sentence, you would have killed somebody. You would have taken somebody's life. If you weren't fear, fearful of your family hearing about it, you would have done something wrong. The truth is that the only thing that separates us from our actions and our sin is the name of Jesus. It is a name above all names to which every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. He is the only thing that saves you from your wretched hearts. He is the only thing that saves you from harboring anger or harboring frustration or harboring bitterness or wanting to murder somebody in your heart. He is the only thing that saves you from that. And when you understand that salvation is not by works, it's by faith. You have faith that he can change your heart. You have faith and you realize that you're not right. How many people understand that we are not right? We're not right. And the only one who can make us right is God. He's the only one who can change our hearts. He's the only one who can massage us and tear, tear, take us in a different direction. He's the only one who can comfort us when we're thinking with frustration. Has anybody ever been frustrated to where you wanted to lash out? Amen. You have to know that the only reason you didn't lash out was not because of your goodness, because you're not good without God. It's because of God's goodness. 
Salvation is not by works. It's by faith in Jesus. God saved you from the deeds of your heart by the way of his son, Jesus Christ. We have to know that the word of God is alive and active in this room. It's alive and active to those who believe in it. Those who want to take the word and apply it to their lives. If you have received his word and you understand his word, then then you apply his word. You say, okay, I've got some issues with my heart. Has anybody said that in here? Because I know I'm not the only person who had frustration before and wanted to scream and wanted to say some words that I haven't said in years. I remember on the way here, I mean, somebody cut me off and I'm like, no, they didn't cut me off. Before, what what would we have said? You would have have floored the gas and went in front of them and said some words we shouldn't say. You have to know that the work and the change that happens in you is not because of you. It's because of God, because of the work that God has done on your heart. Because if he left your heart in the condition, we would be murdering people just like everybody else is. And so we we can condemn the person who took 19 lives, but we need to be uh, uh, be moving forward on helping these people to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior so he can stop the murdering in their heart, which will stop the murdering on this earth. And if we don't understand that, we sit there and blame that kid was bad. That kid was, no, that kid had the same heart that you had before you knew Jesus. So we need to learn to be the best that we can be So that we can go out and spread the gospel and save other people from these circumstances. We can sit there and get mad about Uvalde and get mad about the things that happen in Texas and things that happen in other states. We can get as mad as we want. But if we're not doing our job, the enemy will continuously work. If we don't tell people about Jesus, he's going to tell people about anger. If we don't tell people about the Lord, he's going to tell people about hatred. If we don't tell people about the glory, the glory of God, he's going to tell people about frustration and race and uh, all these things, bitterness. We have to do our job. So that we don't look at these things and say, man, this is such a sad situation. That engulfs me with the presence of God to go out and tell more people about Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. You think this is bad. Imagine this world without us. Imagine if there was no more lifting up the name of Jesus. That is what we would call hell. And so if the word of God is alive and it's active, that means that what we just talked about, you just learned something. If you have received his word and you understand it, then it changes you. You know that not just murdering is bad, but murdering in the heart is bad. Not just hatred is bad, but hatred in the Heart is bad. Don't we understand that now? So now that you know that, you can fix what's wrong with you. You can give it to God and say, no, I will not be angry anymore. I will not harbor hatred anymore. I will not harbor bitterness anymore. I will give all glory and honor to God. Write this down. Change happens when your habits change. Change happens when your habits change. You have to take your habit from just reading the word of God to reading and understanding the word of God. Having a Bible is not enough. Having a Bible and understanding how to read the Bible and apply it to your life is enough. When habit changes, when your habit changes, then change happens. And so you have to make a new habit today. Whatever your habit was, change it. Shift it. Our reading the word has has established the will of God. What is the will of God? Don't murder. Which way? Both ways. Don't be angry. Don't hate. 
Which way? Both ways. Because both ways kill. Don't be the lion with the bars unleashed. Know that the bars are gone from your heart. And you got to operate in love. And so we understand in establishing the will of God. It's not just to control our actions, but it's also to control our hearts. Before you do anything frustrated, first starts in your heart. You came to church today before you came to church today. Can you give God a round of applause in the house of the Lord? You saw yourselves getting up. You saw yourself getting ready. You saw yourselves eating your food. You prepared last night for what you were going to do today because the work of God is operating in your hearts. You have, in order to change your habits, you have to change. And so when we read this word of God, take it seriously. Don't play with it. Don't just be happy. Well, I read a chapter today, but do you understand that chapter? Yeah, I'd rather you read two sentences and look at a commentary and saturate yourself with the presence of those two sentences than to read a whole chapter and be glad that you read the chapter but understand nothing in it. It's okay with a novel to read a chapter. But with the word of God, you must understand it. I'm doing you no good if you're not understanding the word of God. And so the one thing I would say is to make sure you get yourself some type of commentary. If you don't understand which one you want to use, ask the elders, ask the people of the church, which commentary is good. And so you have to understand the will of God by reading the word of God and then apply the way of God. If you don't do that, you're setting yourself up for failure. You can read it all you want. The enemy wants you to read. The enemy even knows the word of God. Do you understand that? He probably knows it better than you. All he's trying to do is divide. And he divides by using your lack of knowledge. The scripture says we perish because of our lack of knowledge. But if you make a determination to learn the word of God today, to say, I will not read without understanding, it is no longer a novel to you. It is the word of God, the rhema word of God. You will have change in your lives. Look up here and say, read the word of God. Understand the will of God. And apply the way of God to our lives. In Jesus, name. in Jesus' name. If you believe that, give God honor and glory in the house of the Lord. Amen. Can we bless God? Amen.